I'm really delighted uh, to be here and looking across campuses as Janet picked me up to bring me on campus today and was thinking about the many years that I have been on this campus and I mean many, many years. And so as they, as Carol, where's Carol? As Carol was uh, organizing my uh, agenda, I kept asking about various people, she and Greg, and they would say, well, they're retired. Well, they're retired. It's like, oh my goodness, is that a message for me? Well, she should be retired. Um, but thanks, Matt, for that really great uh, introduction. And I'm really, really honored to be here presenting this uh, lecture today. And I was reading about um, the Bennett family lecture and how it became part of Penn State. And it's really befitting today that I'm talking about what I'm talking about uh, today because she was really focused on a mission of identifying ways that children's health and well being could be protected. She also focused on family, communities, and schools. So I just am really delighted that we finally got this to happen because I know that. Uh, by partners in crime have been really trying to get this to be pulled off. And so you pulled it off. Uh, so I'm really, really happy to be here. And it's always great uh, as a researcher to, to be able to share my work, but also to be to receive thoughts from the audience. So I do hope that I can do speed talking today so that I can allow time for, for the audience to, um, to in, enter, in, engage in the, in the conversation with me today. And I'm I'm a Mac user, so this is a dangerous place to have me today. Okay, I think this little arrow here moves things. You may have to come here and move, do slides for me, sir. Okay, so so uh, true to form as a teacher, we talk about what we're going to. We share an outline of what we're going to talk about, and then at the end of it, you can be the evaluator to determine whether or not I said those things that I told you I was going to talk about in terms of these critical points that I want to cover today. And so I'm going to start with um, first situating my work into a theoretical framework to help you understand why I do the work that I do. Uh, looking at the impact of structural oppression and racism on African-American families, but also shifting it to the point that I also look at things that these families do to protect themselves in the midst of having to na navigate uh, such uh, toxic, oftentimes toxic situations. Uh, but I'm going to leave uh, the presentation today not only talking about things that we oftentimes don't think about when we're doing preventive intervention trials, we're so focused on looking at those outcomes for which the study was funded that we miss opportunities to look at those things we're actually changing, that we haven't even targeted. And so I'm gonna share with you some nuggets that we found in our looking at these two programs, particularly as it relates to ways in which we were changing things in the family that was actually preparing these families to navigate structural systemic racism. And at the time, it was not this coin that everybody is talking about. Now. Since COVID, that's what you hear. But we were really doing these things and these families were using these tools in, in, uh, in terms of not only being resilient and tomorrow I'll talk about resistance as a way of coping as well that's positive. And so these families were doing these things without our even knowing it, but the way to know it is to go into the data and ask those questions about things that weren't, you weren't necessarily funded to do. And then I want to talk in with leveraging opportunities as prevention scientists that we should really begin to think about in terms of the approach that we take, drawing on an article that I did with my wonderful colleague, Hendricks Brown and several other colleagues are looking at ways that we should begin to re-envision prevention science. And if it means retooling in order to re-envision that we should do that as well. So this is a model that uh, I, and along with my colleagues created, and it really situates my work in the context of how I think about the lived experiences of families of color and particularly African-American families. But it could also be used to look at other marginalized communities because a lot of the stressors that many families experience really come from those laws that were made many, many years ago, vestiges of slavery and Jim Crow. And my colleague, um, 
uh, Cynthia Garcia Cole talked about this or presented this model looking at ways in which we should be able to start thinking about studying children of color because she suggested that people's position, their social position in life really is a consequence of the historical society in which they are born into. And that when those situations occur, it sets individuals up for a lot of stressors that my uh, that a colleague Grace Peterson and great Marie Peters and Grace Massey mentioned many years ago. They call it mundane environmental stress, and these are things just just part of your life. They they are just things that are structurally a part of your life, but they filter down to cause vulnerabilities in families, and those vulnerabilities then could lead to negative outcomes, which is this box on the far corner of, of the model here. But what we know about families is that they navigate and they thrive and they survive. And so my work centers a lot on what Ann Matston calls ordinary magic. And one colleague, uh, well, a comedian said in one of the Grammy shows, it's not ordinary. It's just what, it's not, it's, it's not ordinary and neither is it magic. It's making things work in the context of what you have to do. And so it's these ordinary magic or these protective processes, these strength-based processes that help families to navigate this really, really crazy society that they oftentimes find themselves raising their children and living. And so my work with today is gonna focal, focus a lot on these protective strength-based processes and ways in which we've shown that they demonstrate positive outcomes for children and families as part of these two preventive intervention trials that I'll share with you today. I talk about systemic racism and poverty in concert because both of them have been linked to a widening list of disparities, not only health disparities, but educational disparities, job disparities, a lot of disparities. And one person said, if you're going to begin to address racial bias in medicine, you need to start with the skin. And I'm reminded of a recent article by my colleague, Jean Brody, that showed how it really does get under your skin, such that following these groups of kids in the family and community health study over time, what he realized is that there were a group of kids, and I'm talking about his work and not my own, but I'll get to mine. But he found out in the study that there were groups of kids that looked absolutely fabulous. They had finished school, they weren't using drugs, they were in college, and appear to be doing all of the milestones that we would consider to be positive developmental trajectory. But when he began to look inside at their, at the genetic alleles, what he found was that these kids that looked perfect on the outside were experiencing early stages of aging. Chronic disease, early prediabetes, precardiovascular problems, and he talked about that in the context of navigating this toxicity in a way that you suppress it. And, it's, and, and it eventually shows up, maybe not the way that you're functioning mentally, but it's having effects on you uh, physically. And so when I began to then look at how does racism really find itself in navigating into families, there's increased stress when you're having to deal with these kinds of situations. Increased stress leads to mental health problems because of trauma. Increased endorsement of suicide. One of the things that we know about African-American youth in particular is that the suicide rate has increased by 500% over the last decade. Something is happening. It compromises people's personal outlook or optimism about life. It elevates conflict within families and also has been linked to violence in families. This increased vulnerability then makes people susceptible to other negative life events, decrease the kind of relationships that one would have, which may exp explain the increased uh, marital quality or low quality in uh, African-American marriages. Then there's a spillover effect that you see in the social emotional development of their children. And these over time are pathways that lead to not only mental health functioning disparities, but also to physical health outcomes. And so today I'm going to share some work from a longitudinal study called the Family and Community Health Study. It was a very large study of 900 families uh, funded uh, with, a co with a 
Maine PI is uh, ran Conger many, many years ago. I was telling someone in a story earlier, we started out with 21 investigators. I was the only assistant professor, untenured at the time with all of these big, uh, very, very influential scholars at the time, but I learned a lot from working with these scholars. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this data set. So the first study, uh, I asked the question, if families are experiencing uh, regular negative life events, do you find an amplification of the ways that these negative life events affect families when you add on the experiences of racial discrimination? And this study was done back in the early 2000, I say 200, but 2000s. I feel like I'm that old sometimes. Um, and so what this model shows is the, the link between stressful life events and decreased psychological functioning, which means just experiencing death in the family, cars, you know, running down, uh, financial problems, job loss, all of those negative life events decrease psychological functioning for these women. And when psychological functioning is decreased, it also compromises the parents' caregiving practices. But what we found is that when people are in these positive, supportive relationships with their partner, inter intimate partner relationships, it buffered the negative effects of stressful life events on psychological function that lead into parenting. So if you got a supportive partner, while you may be stressed out, while you may be experiencing depression and mental health changes in your life, that supportive spouse doesn't compromise your ability to parent your child well. So then we wanted to know if we begin to look at a group of stack models, could we determine ways in which uh, the discrimination adds to the kind of stressful life events and the links between uh, psychological functioning and caregiving? And what this particular model shows is that indeed, both psychological function and, and intimate partner quality were poorer among women that experienced both negative life events on top of the amplification of racial discrimination. And the more racial discrimination these women experience, it decreased the quality of their relationship with their partner in addition to their psychological functioning, which then led to more problems among these women in their caregiving practices with spillover effects then on their children. And so you can see the cascading or the domino effect of not just, just dealing with these ubiquitous kinds of events that we all experience, but what happened to families when there's this added pressure of these social oppressive stressors. The next study uh, that I looked at, and it wasn't specifically about racism, but I posed the question, if you look at a group of African-American males over time, could you identify groups of kids that were doing well over time? And these were kids ages uh, 11 to 18, to 18 and during the time of the study. And I wanted to know, this is the model, I guess I should show the model. So this is the model that I, that I wanted to look at. I looked at two models. The first model was looking at involved vigilant parenting and its impact on youth development and adjustment and then I wanted to know whether or not the pat racial socialization mattered in terms of how these boys were developing over time and would it serve as a protective process as we look at their developmental trajectory. And the findings reveal that indeed, involved vigilant parenting promoted future orientation, future orientation elevated kids self-regulation, Self-regulation decreased the likelihood that they would engage with deviant peers, furthermore enhanced the likelihood that they were gonna hang out with pro-social peers. And hanging out with pro-social peers increased the likelihood that they were going to internalize as they moved into late adolescence, their parents' own social norms about how you should be behaving in the presence of your peers. That means also to avoid risk, risky behaviors. And then I wanted to know then, 
What's the connection then between internalizing your parents' social norms about behavior and avoiding risk-engaging behaviors? Would it be predictive of decreasing substance use, teen pregnancy, early on se sexual activity, and number of sexual partners? And indeed, having your parents, the internalization of those social norms, did indeed serve a protective function for these young people or these young men as they transition from middle childhood to young adulthood. The next question was, does it differ then by, by gender? And so I ran the model again, which we haven't published the study, we keep putting it on the back burner, but we looked at whether or not this model worked differently for boys versus girls over time. And we see that Indeed, the pathways by which parents are protecting their children to begin to develop in a very competent way is similar for males as well as females. Where the difference lie is the ways in which social norms are internalized by males versus females such that we saw greater internalization of parental norms by girls than boys as evidenced by increased substance use and number of sex partners manifested by the boys. My next question was in a profile analysis is, if we look at these 400 and something boys, can we identify kids who appear to be varying in the, their engagement in risk behaviors? And not only that, will we see that there's some groups that start out engaging in risk behaviors and keep going up, which we consider the high risk group in both sex and drug use, early sexual onset and drug use. And then would we see a group that experimented during normative developmental years, which is what adolescents are supposed to do. And then do they deescalate the experimentation? And it, and it truly is, as Erickson would say, these are kids engaging in exploration. They're experimenting with their environment as a form of identity formation. And so what we were able to do then is have these two models where we had the gray list includes these boys that were low risk, and you can see where the patterns are, and then the black or high risk engagers. And you can see from the model of the black dotted line, there are a group of boys that started out in risky behaviors, and they just keep kept escalating in those behaviors from ages 16 to 25. So the question then became for me is, how, how many boys did this represent? And so what it represented was 8% of the boys were these high-risk boys. If I didn't do this profile analysis, I would think that all these boys, like my model showed earlier, all these boys were at risk of high engaging behavior around drugs and sexual partners. But there are pockets of boys that are. And so looking within analysis, we see that 91.7% of these boys were these normative experimenters. They were exploring as one would expect during adolescence and young adulthood. Then the question became, what's differentiating these boys that are high risk versus the kids that experimented and they stopped? Critical aspect of that process is parenting. Consistent discipline, inductive reasoning for uh, the high risk males, for the, for the high risk, and then the willingness to participate, willingness to participate in sexual, I mean, risky behaviors and having positive images of youth who engage in risky behaviors. So such a means then that peer influence was great for these particular kids engaging in high risk behaviors, resulting then in higher levels of them engaging in risk continuously as they moved uh, over time. And the patterns for the males and females were very similar in terms of what was important. One of the things that we did in another study is trying to find out where do people go? Where do black families go when they are interested in finding help for mental health issues or behavioral health issues? And one of the things that really sticks out and something has happened to my ledger, but the red bar 
the question was asked, who would you prefer to go to if you were having mental or behavioral problems with your children? The highest number, the red bar is family. The pink bar is psychologist. The orange bar is pastors. The green bar is schools. So you can see then if that is the case, if families, schools, and pastors are the key people that these families would want to go to if they were, a, if their child, and these all were mothers whose child, whose child rated high on oppositional defiant behavior. So they really were in need of some kind of clinical care, but they were not in clinical care. The other part of the story is the way that they got in clinical care with psychologists was once the child committed an offense and became part of the juvenile justice system. So that was an entryway rather than a prevention scientist saying, if this is what will help move these families into some kind of treatment, let's partner with families, pastors, and schools in order to address the needs of this ch these children. And so as a consequence, addressing disparities through family-centered programs is seems to be a viable thing to consider to do because they can prevent a lot of adverse experiences and outcomes happening to children as well as the parents themselves. Why fam why why parent why family centered programs? Because it's a fundamental proximate place where kids are and they have access to them. And someone asked me once once. Why do you focus on middle childhood versus early childhood? One, because I don't know anything about early childhood. But more importantly, it's a critical developmental period where families still have the touching of their children. They can still touch them. While they're beginning to look a little bit out the door at their peers, you can still begin to inoculate them a bit more with those family processes that's going to protect them as they move outside the world. So family programs serve as longitudinal as well as developmental interventions. So they not only need to be family focused, but you need to follow people over time and they need to be developmentally appropriate for the families and oft time tailored, cultural or contextually tailored. And we had a great conversation today with, with Janet's group about this tailoring process. It's through these family-centered programs that we can begin to look at enhancing those processes like family relationships to promote strength and resilience, and then events those positive changes, not only in the way the family is functioning, but it's spillover effect in terms of reducing problems among children. So I've taken this longitudinal study from the Family and Community Health Study and another study with single moms that we followed over 17 years, and we've learned a lot by looking at these families over time. And we translated then those informa that, that information from our findings to identify malleable targets that we could then move into and translate into preventive intervention trials. And the two one that I'm going to mention to you today is a strong African-American families program and the pathways for African-American success. The way that we do our work, we partner with the communities. So we not only go out in the communities and talk with them, but we share with them in usable language, the findings that inform what we're planning to do from our longitudinal studies. And I remember our story once we went into a community in Georgia and there, one of the deacons uh, that was at the meeting, he says, I don't understand all those spaghetti strings that you have up there. It looks like uh, spaghetti, what is spaghetti junction in Atlanta? So you come back and put this stuff in layman's terms. So we now say things that they can, we don't show these kinds of models in other words. But what we do, we partner with the community through focus groups, through what we call community liaisons. And that's people that become part of our research team. And then we have community ambassadors. And these are people that have gone through our various programs have been part of our research studies. And we can say to families that are reluctant to be in our studies, call Ms. Jones. And she can tell you, you tr she lives in your community. You, yes, I know her. Call her and ask her, do we come into your community like helicopters and then leave? 
ask her how do we do how do we treat the communities when we're there that information then our community members not only give us sanction about what it is that we're planning to do but they also offer what we call prescriptive theory and that is how we should be implementing the program in their community they even help us with the hiring of staff as i mentioned to someone er uh, earlier give us feedback on whether or not the rest, the, the, the amount of dosage or the number of sessions that we're planning to hold, will people come? So we seek them as experts in the process of designing and developing our program. They also help us understand and we tell them about our causative theory or theory of change that we're going to be using in our preventive intervention trial. This entire process has been used with the SAFE as well as a PASS program and is now being used for our effectiveness trials uh, in community settings. So I mentioned earlier what I target in this work are those things that I mentioned, malleable targets. And they are those prohibiting kinds of things that families do through accessing their strengths that cause them to decrease ways in which these stressors or social determinants of health is what we're calling them now, of influence families. This is a causative model that guides both SAFE and PASS program. And we, we target these mediators that we call regulated communicative parenting and interpersonal protective processes in youth. And our thought is that by targeting those processes, they will evince then those outcomes that we see earlier. So it's not an HIV, program. It's not a drug program. It's not a sexual risk reduction program. It's a family strength-based program. Because if you see what we're targeting, we're targeting family strength-based processes and not, th not the outcome that we want to accomplish. This is what the program looks like. Caregivers, uh, this is the in-person care when, when people were coming to programs in person. Uh, caregivers meet together kids meet together, then they come together, mom and child or dad and child, and they work together as a family for an hour. I'll show several findings. Uh, this is another spaghetti uh, model uh, with lots of text on it, as my husband would say. But it's a model, it's a, it's a what we, the question that we had for this particular article was, what is the long-term effect of the SAFE program over time as these kids navigate between middle childhood and young adulthood? And do those things that we we focused on with regard to parenting really hold over time? And mind you, you know about the SAFE program because you offered in Janet's program, but it's a seven week program offered during middle childhood and that's it. There are no boosters or anything. So the question is, does it hold? And what this model shows is yes, it does. And in fact, we were more interested for this particular study is does it create a sense of awareness for these kids when risk opportunities are available? Do they avoid them? Because we have this risk uh, resistance efficacy measure in the program. Does, does, does it work? Does it work when they actually get in situations where they could have sex, they could drink, they could smoke, they could steal? And we find that yes, it does. That, and it happens by the program's direct effect on their parents when they were middle childhood. So those parenting processes held on to the point that it kicked in for the child when the child got to the point where they were actually experiencing those uh, risky behaviors. And we saw the same thing in terms of reducing uh, alcohol and substance use. And this is a, a better picture of that particular model, but you can see the uh, these internal youth internal processes decreased the likelihood that they were going to really take advantage of those risk opportunity situations, three o'clock when no one's home and they were home from school. They weren't doing those things. And they held on as they moved into uh, young adulthood. So overall, the SAFE program has shown us that what we targeted and the targets came were, again, from the studies that we had examined longitudinally on these families, just moved them into a curriculum. But they hold, they held in terms of ways in which those proximal parenting processes were actually beginning to facilitate positive developmental outcomes for these children, reducing their willingness to not only engage in those behaviors, but to avoid them over time. 
Then the safe, so I was in the process of making a decision about what to do with my competing continuation uh, for safe. And I tell the story, and I don't think my nephew nor brother-in-law knows that I tell that I use the story in my talk. But I couldn't think of what to do and how to do something innovative other than following these kids over time. I wanted to do something different. I passed by my nephew's room. It, it, we were at dinner at my sister's home. My nephew, who was almost as tall as his dad at the time, almost six feet, grunting. I said, high test testosterone in the, in the dining room. And they were just grunting at each other, weren't really talking to each other. And then I go by his room. They're playing a game when um, the 76ers guy, what is his name? That was so great. Short guy. Iverson. Who who remembered? Who remembered out there? They're just dating ourselves, that's all. So Iverson was a fat, was a big player. So my nephew was Iverson, and I don't know who my brother-in-law was. But rather than playing the game, they were leaning on each other in conversation. And his dad said, well, so what was going on this afternoon outside of, uh, with you and your, your friends? What happened? And he's not looking at his dad, he's looking at the screen. And they were in this deep conversation about his interaction with his peers. Uh-huh. I said, what if you could move safe into a digital platform where people are interacting in that space, receiving the content of the program? And that's where this particular program emerged from. Um, 2007 is when this program was uh, funded. I use the highway or these, these depictions because the focus of the program, come on in, come on in. This is a family gathering. <laughs> so I use it because I talk about the, the whole program is centered around a road map and a journey. And that along your journey, you have different opportunities to either stay on the road or go off the, off the ramp. But when you go off the ramp, it doesn't mean you're there and lost forever. You can get back on because there's always an on-ramp. And so throughout the program, that's how they're going through the program. Parents as well as kids, with parents having some sense of understanding ways to keep their kid on this journey and how to move them back on the road when they do get off because experimenting and exploring is part of getting off. So it's a three-arm study where uh, one group of families are randomly assigned at the county level to either the control, which was really literature control, uh, or the small group, or to receive the e-health program. Uh, the programs are six sessions, 45 minutes, all of it is developed or implemented in this virtual space with avatars being the instructors. So there's a youth avatar that was actually a college student in our research lab that we character, well, we, the graphics designer characterized him and he's, you know, he's a youth avatar with kids uh, that are avatars um, that were local kids that went to one of my research lab uh, members uh, church. And so I'm going to talk to you a bit about what we found in this program. So the first program, we asked a question because it was a delivery modality platform experiment. Does the way that families experience or receive the information matter in terms of the things that we were trying to change in the preventive intervention? And so we looked at these platforms that I mentioned earlier, literature control, it was the same kind of information that they got, but in booklets that were mailed to the home the same weeks that we were offering the small group and the digital program. So this model, and I hope you can see it well, but this, we tested the two, the, the two uh, active experiments, which was the small group and the technology group or the e-group. And what you can see from this findings is that we saw greater changes in the parenting processes around challenging topics, 
meaning that parents in the technology group demonstrated greater changes from pre to post test and long-term follow-up in talking to kids about racism, sex, drugs. Parents in the small group demonstrated greater changes in normative parenting, monitoring, and those kinds of things. Youth in the technology group demonstrated greater changes in avoiding risk engaging behaviors, sex and drugs in the technology group. We didn't change that behavior for kids in the small group. What we did was changed the like the will the likelihood that kids would hang out, which has just come to haunt me, and I hate to say it, hang out with deviant peers if the opportunity presented itself. A contagion, an atrogenic effect is what they told me, but I have an answer for that. If we have time, I could talk about it. Um, so you, so what we see is that the modality, really targeted different things, different things. So if you have families, for example, whose kids are at risk for just general parenting things, they stay out late, they do, you may then, those in the small group is the one that's benefiting from that. But if you want to focus on risk reduction and managing adverse situations for parents, the technology work, for kids, the technology work for, for the things that we were targeting in the intervention as developmental outcomes. Then the next one, we looked at all three modalities to try and determine what was different about them. And I'll go to this particular slide. So we compared the technology versus the literature control. Then we looked at the small group versus the literature control. Then we looked at the technology and the group again. And so our findings show that for the technology and the literature control, we parents in the technology group demonstrated greater changes in articulated norms and expectations to their kids about risk. We didn't change that for the literature control. The other change that we saw was frequency and conversations that parents were having with their children just in a supportive way higher in the technology group and a reduction in risk engaging intentions among kids in the technology group, didn't see it in the in the uh, in the uh, literature control. Similar kinds of patterns in the small group versus literature control. Only we saw more differences for small group versus literature control, primarily around supportive communication, uh, frequency of conversations, conflict conflict reflective or talking kid to kids so that you don't get into this conflictual fight. And then youth reported that there are greater changes in parents talking to them about their expectations regarding risk behaviors. We didn't see that in the technology group. And then when you look at the technology versus the small group, the only thing that we saw was a reduction in risk engaging intentions. Everything else was the same. So what does this say? It says that when you look at comparing these on these indicators that we, that we just demonstrated, Either program works, except reducing risk engaging intentions for kids. So you have a menu where you can offer uh, these particular classes, uh, these two sessions, both platforms work. So a new project that I have launched with a neuroscientist is merging neuro and prevention scientists to see how the program is changing the brain function of kids, um, looking at triggers, that we target in our intervention as baseline assessment, exposing the kids to the program, doing brain imagery, fMRIs again, to see what is lighting up. And the advantage of this particular methodology is it allows us to look at a profile of a kid, where their risk might be, and tailor the sessions based on what's lighting up such that all sessions may not be needed to change the behavior. So what did we find? Right now we have found in terms of preliminary analysis that the cognitive and emotional functioning measured through and, and self-regulatory behaviors, 
measured through the fMRIs or events and greater changes in kids that we have been following in this particular study. And so it suggests then that this may be influencing stronger couplings of reward seeking or decreasing these reward seeking behaviors and increasing inhibitory behaviors or control among kids. And we know specific sessions for which these children are sensitive to. And so that's a new uh, new endeavor that, that we have on the horizon. So all the things that I said about it is true. I'm gonna move to these non-targeted preventions because I really do want to spend uh, time for us to talk. And so one of the things that we were not expecting that my colleague, Steve Beach, uh, published several years ago, he said, he's a person that looks at marriage and depression. And he said, if I had, a, if, if, I wonder if the safe families have any parents that are clinically depressed. And yes, we did. And so we, he looked at then, is the program having any effect on changes in clinical depressive depression among these parents? And so he went into the data set. Again, it's asking questions that the program wasn't even designed to ask. And what we found was yes, indeed, that the mothers that were clinically depressed at baseline, diagnosed clinically depressed at baseline, that by long-term follow-up, their mental health functioning looked like parents that were not clinically depressed. And how did it happen? Not by just over time they were better. It was because of the program's direct effect on their parenting that then began to decrease their depression. And so it's basking. Any of you that are parents, you know what happens with your endorphins when your kid does something well, like Deion Sanders. I just had to say that. Okay. So what I've been doing lately is the COVID-19 to me brought back a way of our my, me thinking about my own work in terms of those protective personal equipment that Black families put on in order to navigate uh, toxic uh, environments. And so I'm gonna talk really, really quickly about this so we can get through and I can talk to you. You can talk to me. So I have this model that my postdoc developed that depicts this auditory magic. And so she took this, this uh, hazard uh, suit and she talked, she said, what, what I see is that you have this sprayer of kinship support that you can put all around you. You have these goggles with optimism because it makes you see the world and frame it in a very different way. You surround yourself with community socialization. It's the center of who you are because your, your community keeps you centered. Racial pride is part of what you use in order to be able to make your, it's a covering of this particular suit. Racial socialization is what you use in order to help you direct how you walk in this particular space. And spirituality is what you walk on. It's that faith that you're gonna get through this. So we've written about this in a recent paper that's in developmental psychopathology, but I wanted to share that with you as we begin to talk about what we've seen these programs do as it relates to reducing family's vulnerability to racial discrimination. And I'm gonna shoot through these really fast. This is the model that we tested. We wanted to know whether or not racial discrimination influenced psychological functioning and the role of SAFE in buffering these protective processes, racial socialization and black pride that therefore decreased the likelihood that these kids were gonna engage in a sundry of risky behaviors, including a criminal, uh, criminal in, uh, justice uh, involvement over time. And what we see here is that SAFE it did indeed have an effect, but it was by SAFE's effect on uh, what parents were doing with regard to racial socialization. SAFE did not have a direct effect, effect on Black pride, but the Black pride enhancement happened as a consequence of what SAFE was doing for the parents' racial socialization. These came together collectively to reduce psychological functioning, but racial discrimination decreased positive psychological functioning, but buffered by parents' racial socialization, reducing then the likelihood that these kids would engage in 
all of these negative outcomes that you see there. The last article was just published in Frontier of Psychology. And we asked the question uh, around academic uh, disparities for black kids. And the question is, what are black parents in the SAFE program doing that we didn't measure that really could mimic what we, we call academic racial socialization? And that is preparing your child for being able to navigate in these classroom settings where a lot of the oppressive situations happen for them. And what we found was that, well, one, we were able to really identify these items to pull together with very strong psychometrics, that this is actually happening. And we saw, found that it happens more often for families in the SAFE program. And that then resulted in less likelihood of kids getting in trouble in school, more likely for kids to be bonded to school, and increased likelihood that they did well academically over time from uh, middle school to the end of, of high school. So racial pride and racial socialization events higher uh, grade point averages for these kids and protected them from the school environment. And so I'll leave you with the idea that uh, racialized health inequities is simply not a matter of people changing their behavior or eating certain kinds of foods or the choices that they make. It's not because of a meritocracy, but it's a station that we have in life as a matter of effort. And even when, if you believe that even when people are doing the best that they can and they still aren't doing well, that it's their fault, we're using a color racism lens. And so we have to begin to think about what's the cause, not at the individual level, but the, the structures, those social determinants, and to be more deliberate in thinking about those social determinants when we're trying to explain alcohol, substance use, obesity, pregnancy, whatever it is, mental health functioning. Things don't happen in a vacuum. Parents and kids and communities are part of a larger society. And I would venture to say that generational over time, because many of these families have been dealing with this for generations and that that trauma cycle is not going to end just by me engaging in the kind of work that I do, which is seeing how you're navigating it with your hazard suit on, it's really beginning to stop the toxic waters. And so I'll end with this uh, article that we, that we wrote about envisioning how we might do the work that we do. And I say, design and test upstream interventions build metrics or rebuild them of what success means because it may not mean the same thing. Parents may not be striving for the same successful outcomes for their children if we don't ask them. Um, and looking more at how these successes are imp impaired or enhanced by social determinants. Revisit how we measure, deliberately think about ways in which what we're studying is really a consequence of, of these toxic environments rather than centering it only in that inner circle as Brock and Brennan would talk about. Look at the blind spots is what I also talk about. And don't ignore heterogeneity because all people aren't the same as I showed you in that profile analysis. Call to action questions that you should be pondering and re-examine the complexities of what it means for health equity and social justice in prevention science. I co-edited this uh, book with a colleague at the National Academy of Medicine. And one of the quotes in there saying, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. I thank my funders and my incredible lab, and it's been delightful. Thank you for an amazing talk. And I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on the antibiotic type of behavior they took when they were dealing with their um, their, their peers, the 
The iatrogenic effect? Iatrogenic effect, yes. Uh, you said you could talk a little bit about it a little bit more. Yeah. So, uh, and when this came to haunt me when I submitted my continuing, competing continuation, and this one of the reviewers said, how dare you think that you're going to offer the small group when you created this situation? So I decided to have a member of my lab go and look at whether or not there were groups of kids that came into the program because Mark Lipsy would say, just by being with the person for like 45 minutes, it's difficult to think about. You don't know these kids, that those kids have changed your behavior for six weeks. So anyway, that was one argument. And he said, the reason why we don't know beyond putting a bunch of kids with conduct disorders in the same group for long periods of time, the reason why we don't know is that we seldom have two active groups. We look at a control group and an experimental group. I have two active groups. So now I can tease this out. But what we found is that there were a group of kids whose baseline scores on a lot of child behavioral problems were moving the scores. Uh, and on almost all the measures, all the, all the outcomes that we had. So we have to write first, write the paper, get it peer reviewed and published. Then we can resubmit the article. But the other thing that I've been thinking about though, what is your name? Alexis. Alexis. So one of the things that I've been thinking about too is it's hard doing these small group sessions. Can I have a hand? Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. So I may just go with the technology because it truly is easy. Don't have to worry about fidelity. They can't mess it up because they're not delivering it. So I may not fight that fight, but I am going to write that paper because one of my students did it as a, as a master's thesis. So we are going to publish it, but I may not fight that with those reviewers. I may just get the money and make the technology prettier. You're welcome. I cannot believe. Surely something I said, you say, what? I don't believe that. And somebody, he says, I don't believe that. I believe you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a unique question. Uh, I have a question about when you were describing your work with communities and um, you know, trying to find ambassadors and things like that. You mentioned how a lot of times you uh, is not the best approach to describe like the models and all the theories behind what you're doing and things like that mm -hmm. uh, because that might not always be the best way mm -hmm. to present that material mm -hmm. um so i was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you go about um presenting your research and why you're doing it mm -hmm. to the communities that you're working with that's um, and then like after the fact if you ever like once the research the data has been collected and you're you know developing findings and things like that, um, if you have conversations with those communities afterwards about the results, that's a absolutely great question. And so what we found out after this church deacon scolded us is it's it's storytelling. So we'll say, let us tell you a story about ways in which families we found out in our research studies ways in which families and communities are coming together to help their kids. And so we can say things like what they are. And so we're thinking about having these particular, you know, having developing a curriculum, focusing on these things. What do you think? So one of the things that this same deacon said to us in another meeting, he said, I don't see the church. I don't see the church anywhere in, in what you've been talking about. And we said, Gene and I looked at each other and we said, well, we don't, we don't study religion. And he said, then you better find out about it and come back. And that's been one of the most significant predictors in our empirical longitudinal studies. And so we include it as a way that spirituality in the, in the, uh, the way we talk about our work. 
So, so yes, that's it's storytelling because they understand stories. Um, and then um, the other, you ask about sharing the information. So what we what we do, we uh, quarterly we publish a newsletter. This is what we were doing years ago. Now I would use the different platforms, um, but we would have a newsletter where we would highlight some of the things that were happening that we were finding that were positive, and it was sent out to families. And we would sometimes take the information and have it in puzzles so that they could solve it. So it wasn't just straight out content, but that it was a way to interact with. So then they would have the answer. So we're trying to find out what it creates successful school year for kids. And then they would have to do this puzzle. We would have all these words. And at the end of it, it would show what that particular thing is that we found out. So with, with an absolutely wonderful staff, because it's, you know, it's not like something I would do, but one of the things that I, that, that, is, is letting me know that they're that if you ask people how they want the information turned back to them, they will tell you. We just finished a capacity building project on sickle cell disease with a group of patients. And the patients identified research articles that they thought would be interesting and useful to help them manage their you know, chronic disease. And they then took that information, we had a discussion, and they pulled out the things that they thought were really important. And then we arranged for them to talk to the researcher. And they had they had a one-on-one, -on -one, this team of, of patients, and they told the researcher how this information, at least a supplement to that would be good because you've talked about pain management and you've talked about it in terms that I can't understand except these people helped me, you know, the, the research, research team. And then we asked them, how would you like to receive this information so that we could move it into a platform that we could disseminate it to other patients managing chronic disease? Because what the articles found were really applicable regardless of the chronic disease that you were experiencing. And they told us, some of them were YouTube, some of them were TikTok, some of them were infographics, and they played it out. So we have this little card that we put all this stuff. The, I love working with young people. So our young people in the lab came up with this QR thing and you can scan on it and the videos come up. It's like, oh my God. And the card is really a small card that we've disseminated to patients managing chronic disease. And no one platform works. If you want to know what is it, nothing with us, nothing for us, without us, it's the same phenomenon. You ask them. They're the experts. I, I have a comment, a comment, and you have a question. So first, the comment is, um, what a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really and the weather, remember, I told you it's the it, weather. It was, you just made it sense. But I think it is. No, that was, uh, that was really well done. It was really fun to watch you uh, cover this. And I've been studying families of the older, the older people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was so nice. But, you know. Anyway, so my question is uh, so I. Been really interested in the challenges of single families. Mm. I have to, I'm guilty as anyone. You know, when I recruit families, I'll take any yeah. I'll take a mother, I'll take a father, I'll take both of them, I'll take a grandparent. Yeah, yeah. As long as you have parental treasure, yeah. I'm happy. Same here. Yeah, we all are, right? And then I think about are we are we really truly reaching single parents? Mm -hmm. I know we are, but then there's probably that we're not. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you have such wonderful data. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, just curious, have you been able to kind of teach it that? Oh, it's yeah. Just, there's so much struggle, right? Same. It is, but you know, the Family and Community Health Study, which has 897 families, only a third of them were solo families. So I think it's important to look at who's in the household as an adult and not the marital status. That's one thing that I've learned. Um, and that even when they are solo, they still have access to adult support. And we oftentimes miss asking that 
because they are influencing these children's lives. Grandparents, uncles, boyfriends, girlfriends. So we, you know, so, and and we we were surprised because one of the students in the uh, lab was interested in single parents. And then I said, don't look at marital status, find out how many adults are in the household and have access to helping with these children. So we do know that a third of our sample are solo moms, but solo moms, when we ask them questions about their support, they're connected to churches, they're connected to school PTAs. And so it's broadening the sense of why are they not doing well? But why are they doing well? And oftentimes it's because we've decided that they're single because they're not in a you know married or cohabiting uh, setting. But uh, and so that's that's one one issue that I that I mentioned. One of the things that I, uh, speaking of single moms or and grandparents, what we found in the uh, past program, greater attendance among grandparents who were raising their grandchildren in the technology group versus the small group. They fared extremely well in terms of our intervention targeted outcomes and mediators for these, these, these moms, these grandma, I mean, these parents. And so we began to look much more deeply into why these parents were not coming. Many of them had children that were experiencing behavioral problems, probably a consequence of the setting that moved them to their grandparents' situation. And in these small groups, which is something else I didn't mention to Janet's group, but I started seeing the reluctance for people to respond in these small group settings in 2012, when we launched the past study in, in West Tennessee where the parents just weren't open and jumping up and you know engaging with each other. And we're in an age of texting. And I bet you if we were in a small group and we gave everybody each other's cell number and they would, I bet they would interact much more openly on Texas. But we saw them not responding very well because you gotta tell a lot of your stuff in these small groups. Grandmothers, weren't gonna be coming to these small groups with their people in their community telling them all this stuff. So that was a safe space for the people who were experiencing pretty challenging situations because you can tell the avatar and the avatar is not gonna tell anybody at Sunday school or anywhere else. Um, so, I, so I would suggest, we, you know, we go after whomever these kids' parents are, caregivers are. And we call it caregivers. And um, but what these families, if they have access to what we call collective socialization, the village around you, wherever that village is, that's what's key. And so one idea is to expand the social capital. When we find these these parents in these single situations, it's really to find human capital to help them and center them wherever it might be, and to draw on that uh, in these moments of need. You're welcome. All we're gonna do is go and have cookies, so whatever you wanna do. <laughs> and I've been up since 4.30, just so you know. You too? I'm telling you. <laughs> um, you mentioned on one of your slides rural families. Yeah. Got me thinking about um, you know, here we are in Center County in Pennsylvania. We have the amount of diversity that we have here. Um, and I know some rural communities have a different demographic makeup. Um, can you speak more to the larger context um, that your have come from and whether you think um, some of these community connections or support systems might be different in different parts of the country? You know, they probably are, and they should be. Um, now, do I know that? No. Uh, but what I can tell you is the Family and Community Health Study uh, recruited families from cities in Iowa 
and cities and small towns and rural communities in Georgia. We oversampled for upper middle income black families and our models work quite similarly. The difference is families, kids in Iowa uh, reported greater exposure to racial discrimination than kids in Georgia. What? Yeah. Why do you think that may be so? You're in class and I can ask you a question. Why do you think that? Because we couldn't believe it. It's like, go back and look at that data again. Because they're more likely to be in integrated communities with exposure to people that can impose those experiences on them versus kids in rural Georgia, uh, where they're primarily in predominantly Black communities. And so we actually had to interpret some of the uh, racial discriminatory items for these kids. They were like, what? What are you talking about? Somebody following you around the store? I mean, who? So, so, and so that's, to me, it's another, it's another indication that context matters. Context matters. And we oftentimes don't, we don't give enough attention to that. When we take a program and go into the community and we offer it, and people are looking at you like, I'm not going to do that. You want us to do what? I'm not going to do that. And well, they're difficult. No, they're not. Your program doesn't fit the ecological context. Um, yeah. Okay. Max is standing with the mic. I think he's closing down. Possibly. <laughs> We have to continue the conversation. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I one more round of applause. Oh, thank you. <laughs>